my own. Yeah. All right. Yeah. lights in here. There we go. All right, wake up. Good afternoon. So, <coughs> uh, can you wait one more that and Cooper? Yeah. They're hoarding it at the end. I'm sorry. Can you hand that down? All right. Uh, so, <coughs> today, this is the second to last lecture. So, I assume most of you still need some lecture credits. Um, there'll be one more after this, and then we'll be finished with the semester. So design reviews next week. Is everybody ready? All of your projects done and ready for delivery? No, you already delivered them. Perfect. Good. I'm glad you guys are on top of it. <clears throat> so today we're going to talk about craftsmanship. And this is a really weird thing to teach. Okay? You've probably never had a lecture about craftsmanship before. Uh, so I guess first I'll preface it by saying, uh, this is not a gender-oriented craftsmanship, but craftspersonship is a mouthful, so I'll, I'll use craftsmanship uh, as the gender-neutral version of this. But, uh, so I, I've got an image up here of a hand, right? It's sort of an anatomic hand looking at the muscles and tendons of the hand. It's a very complicated thing, and it's part of what makes us uh, human, right? So the, the ability to build things and make things and create things with our hand. Uh, but craftsmanship can expand way beyond just what you can do with your hands. But it is a sort of image that people associate with craftsmanship. So I'm going to start today with a couple of quotes uh, from some fairly famous people that you've probably heard of uh, about craftsmanship. And so the first one is from Steve Jobs, and he was talking about uh, this I ideas that had happened early in his career that had kind of sent companies in the wrong direction, where they thought, I have an idea, and that's 90% of the work. And I can just hand off that idea, and someone else can take it from there. But there's really a lot of craftsmanship that goes between that idea and a finished product that actually works and works for someone, right? Um, and so, so he had this quote, there's a tremendous amount of craftsmanship between having a great idea and having a great product, OK? Uh, this next guy you guys have probably heard of, Bill Russell. Anybody not heard of Bill Russell? So he won uh, what, two NCAA championships and 10 NBA championships. So pretty much every year that he played his sport, he won the championship. Right? So that's a pretty good record. Um, he wrote an entire book on leadership and had a, a, a chapter on craftsmanship. And he had this idea that um, craftsmanship is mastery of yourself. Right? So you work on mastery of your art, whatever it might be, uh, in his case, basketball. And craftsmanship is mastery of yourself as the uh, doer of that thing. And <clears throat> Bill Russell believed that uh, if you displayed excellence in your work, okay, if you displayed craftsmanship in what you do, that people would look to you naturally as a leader because you wouldn't have to convince them that you should be a leader. They could see it through the quality of your work, right? And I think we probably all know people like that in our teams uh, who do really good quality work and they're a leader whether they're nominated the leader of the team or not, right? You can see it from them because they lead in what they do. Uh, <clears throat> so we'll expand a little bit on this craftsmanship idea today. So today we'll cover one, what is a craftsmanship? Or what is craftsmanship? What does that mean? Uh, and there are a lot of different meanings. So it's kind of an old-fashioned word. You guys probably think craftsmanship is kind of an old-timey idea, like uh, an old man uh, you know, in, a in a garage mechanic working or something like that. Um, We'll talk about how to develop a spirit of craftsmanship so you can build that in yourself. Um, and then a little bit about what craftsmanship means in design, because most of us are on design teams or working in design, right? So I'll show you a few images uh, that kind of look at craftsmanship. So you might think about someone operating a, you know, a hand plane across a piece of wood. I don't know if any of you have ever used a, a hand plane, but um, it's basically a razor blade, and you take just feather widths of wood off, right? So very precise, very delicate, very detailed, and oriented with the hands, right? You're doing this by hand. And that kind of evokes an image of craftsmanship. But maybe we could think about this image, right? So maybe a, an artist at a potter's wheel, right? Very delicate, again, hand-focused motions. Um, and this is kind of maybe a classical image of craftsmanship. I'll give you 
you know, one more here. So um, this is you know, probably an older person and their knuckles are gnarled because they've done this thing so many times. So when we think about craftsmanship, a lot of times we think about experience, right? So someone who, has, who works with craftsmanship, they're not new to it. It's not something they're just starting, um, but it's something they've done a lot of time. So you'll get this kind of intricate detail or very precise work. But what about this, right? Would you say there's craftsmanship behind this? Yeah? I know some of you know what this is, right? So Minecraft is a, a video game, right? So craftsmanship in a video game, and not even in the creation of the video game, but within playing the game? Can you have craftsmanship in that situation? I would argue you can, right? So this person has put in uh, a lot of time and detail into doing this and not settled for anything less than excellence. So, uh, before we go into this, I, we're, we're going to show you a video uh, of, about the Boeing company and their factory. Uh, it's in Washington State. It's the largest building in the world. Okay, so They're going to talk about how they make these airplanes. And so when we think about traditional craftsmanship and you think about you know, some manual labor, that's not the precision that goes into a, an aircraft. right? So this notion of craftsmanship can go beyond manual work. Hopefully this will play.
systems are. When you look at what it takes to put this product together, it's the people applying their hands, their knowledge, their desire to be successful to the actual parts, tools, and engineering of this product to bring it all together. Almost every, everything that we do is hands-on. It's all hand-driven, hand-done, hand-work. It's built by hands. It's not a soulless machine that's building it. Okay, so we'll, we'll end it there, but um, what, what were some thoughts that you had on that video? Anybody? Yeah. Well, they moved everything really slowly, and by the careful movement, slow movement, they were sure. scrapping for it. Sure. And what are some, what are some kind of key words that they mentioned maybe more than once or that they really emphasized? Anybody? A lot of it was done by hand, right? Yeah. Anything else? What about what about the people in the video? Did they seem interested in their work? They all seemed very proud of what they were doing. Really proud, right? Right. So they, they were connected with their work, right? They had emotion and were, were proud of what they were doing. Anything else? Anything you heard that caught you or struck you at all? Yeah, they all talked about their experience, right? How long they'd been there, uh, how much it meant to them, those sorts of things, right? So one of the things that really sticks with me is the, the guy kind of makes a funny face in the thing, but he says, you know, these are, these are people who are willing to work until it's done right, okay? Does that make sense? Right, you would, right? I mean, that's the kind of thing that you would look for in someone who's gonna build that. That's the kind of dedication to craft that you would see, okay? So, uh, you know, you can see for these people that their work and what they do is connected back to them, right? They're invested in it, uh, and they see it as a reflection of themselves, right? So the quality of work that you do as a craftsman, in whatever your field might be, I mean, if you're an educator, if you're a mathematician, whatever it is that you might do, uh, seeing yourself as a reflection of your work, because we are really nothing more than what we do in the world, right? So seeing yourself as a reflection of your work, you will start to take your work more seriously and it will be more meaningful to you, right? So we're gonna talk about three, three people and I guess a, a fourth one who's, who's unnamed um, for just a minute and talk about some of these different things. So if we talk about an artist, what are some of the kind of features or characteristics or personality traits you might see in an artist? Creative, Creative right? a good one. What else? There might be hints behind me. <laughs> oh, skill, sure. Okay, so, so I would say two, two of the hallmarks you'll see in an artist that you may have read up here are skill and creativity, right? So um, when, when an artist works, they may be in a tradition, like, a, you know, an art tradition, but they're really unbound in what they're able to do in their, in their work, right? So, you know, a picture doesn't have any real utility. Um, it might evoke like an emotional response in you when you see it, hopefully it will. That's what you know, the kind of intention of art is. But uh, they're really unbounded by whether it needs to do anything, whether it should or should not, okay? And then if we think about a mechanic, right? So again, there may be hints behind me. When we think about a mechanic, what do you think of? Think outside the box. Like we, what, when you think of a mechanic, what do they do? Right, so they, <clears throat> he said they, they take something really complicated like an automobile and they ensure that it works as designed, right? 
Okay. Anything else? No. Sure. Yeah. So it might, might be clever in the way that they use tools. Somebody else had a hand up. Yeah. Yeah. Taking something that's not functional and making it function as it, as it, like you said, as it was intended, right? So I would say a, a mechanic you would characterize as having skill in what they do, right? And that they work on something that's useful, right? So a mechanic isn't going to create art, right? They're not going to create something that doesn't have some function, okay? So uh, I, I, would, I would posit that a craftsman is someone who is a blend of a mechanic because they work on something useful with skill, and an artist because they are allowed the creativity to come up with new ways, right? So where a mechanic might make the car work as designed, the craftsman might change the design, okay? Might step outside of that. I think a lot of engineers and people who work in the engineering field act as craftsmen, okay? So you can come at a problem that has some need, so there's some utility to what you're doing, and you can apply skill, right? and creativity. So you can learn things that people have done in the past and how the system is supposed to work, but then you can also deviate from that and make it better, right? So you can look into how could we do this better? How could we redesign, okay? So there's one box up here that I didn't label, and this is the intersection of creativity and utility. So you do something useful, right? And you can maybe be creative about what you do, uh, but you don't have much skill, right? So you're kind of an untrained craftsman. What would you call that person? A novice. A novice, maybe. Anybody else? An engineering student. In, an engineering student, right? <laughs> yeah. Does that resonate with any of you? Have you ever been asked to do something that was useful and exercised your creativity and design, but you ha you're doing something you hadn't done before? You didn't have that experience, right? You didn't have that skill level. And I think this happens all the time in our ethics projects, right? We challenge you to be creative. And we challenge you to work on these projects that are useful. But we know when we ask you to do that that you haven't done it before. And you haven't done anything like it before, right? Probably most of you, or all of you, have been asked to do something in your ethics project or expected to that is completely different than your experience, right? Completely outside of anything that you really know how to do. And so this is where we can really work on some strategies to push you toward being a craftsman, okay? Um, taking, taking pictures? Uh, so, so let's talk a little bit more about traits of a craftsman. So uh, a craftsman in general would say you would take pride in your work, right? So the people that worked at Boeing, they were obviously proud. They talked about, here's how long I've been here. We're like a, we're like a symphony, you know, everyone playing in concert, right? So they, they were proud of what they did. And pride can be a, you know, construed as a bad thing, but in, in the case of your work, having pride in what you do can be a very good thing. Um, they're willing to work until it's right, okay? So you don't just try, say, I gave it a shot and give up, right? You keep working, you keep iterating, right? You guys hear this a lot. Keep going, right? Don't give up, don't leave it there. Have a, uh, craftsmen have a passion for betterment. And that's not just of what they're making, but of themselves, right? So you will be better at making or doing whatever that thing is that you're working at if you put in the time to learn, if you exercise creativity to do it different ways, okay? Uh, motivated by mastery rather than status. And this is kind of a, a weird thought, but uh, we often will work for the attainment of something that gives us status, like a grade, okay? So I'm an A student, but a craftsman may be more motivated by the thought of mastery, okay? I might come out of this class with an A, but can I actually do this and apply it in a way that makes sense, okay? So we're uh, challenging you here to do that. Uh, being willing to make personal sacrifices for quality is a tough one, okay? We all have challenges to our time, and are we willing to give up doing something we wanna do to do better at something that we should be doing, okay? Uh, and that's a challenge throughout your life, and again, that's a part of learning to manage your time and set priorities. Um, and using creativity to discover better methods. So you're not just a mechanic. You're not just learning to crunch numbers or go through equations or do something the same way over and over, right? 
you're challenged to have creativity and to find new, better ways to do it. So we're going to do a, a little bit of, a, of an activity. So uh, first thing I want you to do is grab that piece of cardstock that I gave you and draw a circle real quick. I could have brought that to you. That's fine, thank you. <laughs> All right, did everybody draw a circle? That wasn't too tough, was it? Okay, so what I want you to do now is to draw a circle again. And this time, first of all, uh, your first circle I hope wasn't ginormous. Looks like a lot of you drew huge ones. If you did, flip your paper over and draw a circle that's about two inches in diameter, okay? So you can do it real quick, quick circle, two inches. All right, everybody's got a circle. It doesn't take very long. Okay, now what I want you to do is draw a circle of the same size, but I want you to draw me your best possible circle. So draw, draw the very best circle you can do. Okay, everybody got that? Best, best possible circle? Okay, now there's some scissors floating around you'll have to share. Some people have their own, that's awesome. Uh, what I want you to do is on the, off the bottom of your sheet of paper, I want you to cut a strip of paper that is about three inches long and uh, about half an inch wide. So three by half, and this is not the scale. So cut them quick and pass the paper down so everybody can get a chance. Was there extra paper somewhere? No? We used it all? That's pretty good. Now I, know, I know I've just instilled in you the sense of perfection in this circle, but go ahead and cut this uh, little rectangle pretty quickly. Nothing to fear. All right, does everybody have a rectangle? Close? Okay, so now what I want you to do is to take your push pen, everybody has a pen, and I want you to push a hole through each side of the paper. Okay, so you have two holes. Let's make sure they're separated by, you know, at least an inch, okay, at, at minimum. And I apologize for you who use metric systems. <laughs> All right, everybody got a rectangle with two holes in it? Raise your hand if you don't. Okay, still need scissors. At least an inch. You can use as much of the paper as you want, though. All right, everybody have a rectangle with two holes. Oh, come on, guys. It's a rectangle with two holes. Let's get. Okay, so if you have a rectangle with two holes, what I want you to do is put your push pin through one of the holes. So pin this one down, 
into your piece of paper, put your pencil or pen or whatever you have through the other one, hold the pen down on the paper, and use the uh, piece of paper to circumscribe a circle. Does anybody have a circle? Anybody still working? All right, raise your hand if that was your best circle. Uh, half, okay. Raise your hand if your first one was your best circle. Two, raise your hand if your second one was the best circle. Couple, couple. You guys have a hard time connecting the ends on the third one? Or you just freehand that well? Okay, let's try, let's try one more. So this is gonna be a bit of a funny technique. It's hard to demonstrate. But take your pinky finger and make a knuckle, and then put it down in the middle of the paper, and then touch your pencil down with the same hand, and then with your off hand, rotate the paper around your pinky, okay? So you're using your pinky as an axis to spin the paper. Good. Huh? <laughs> All right. Who got their best circle at last time? Anybody? Who did it faster than it took them with the tool? That should be everybody? Yes, including the time to build the tool. That, so no one's raising their hand, but everyone should say yes. That was much faster. Okay. So I appreciate your participation in hand raising. That was good. Okay, so, so as you moved along this path, what were some of the what were some of the changes that you had, right? So assuming that your last two were better than your first two, what were some of the changes, right? So when you, when you drew the second circle, you had some practice, right? So you had some experience drawing a circle, and you also had some attention to detail, right? You were trying to draw your best circle. No, I'm saying your second circle. So when you, you just drew the best circle you could draw by hand, okay? okay? So you had, draw, you had drawn your first circle, you now did your second circle, so hopefully it improved some, right? Some of you really took attention to detail in the first place when I asked you to draw a circle, some of you didn't. Now what about when you moved to the tool, right? So you gained some, uh, some assistance, right? So you had a tool to do the job. So you had maybe a higher skill level in what you were doing. But you also had someone teaching you another way to do it, right? So you had someone there to help you and show you. So as you go through and do projects in which you don't have a lot of experience, right? You lack that skill piece for craftsmanship. Please find people to help you, right? Find mentors. So use your TA, use your advisors. We've got people all over this university who will help you with your projects. So don't flounder and struggle when you have a hard time. Come and find someone to help you, okay? And then in the last bit, uh, looking at a, a different way of doing things, right? So you probably got, some of you got a pretty decent circle using a very simple method with your own hand. You didn't need a tool. All you needed was that little bit of guidance, right? So look for new creative ways to do these things, okay? So look outside of the normal method or the first thing that someone shows you to do and apply your creativity and find new ways of doing things. It may take you longer the first time, but you'll develop that sense of skill that you can step outside of the bounds of what you're given, okay? Um, so talk a little bit um, about these kind of two things that pull at a craftsman, okay? One being discipline. And discipline is sort of the mechanic side of this, right? So I'm gonna do things the right way and I'm gonna keep working at them until they're done, okay? But I'm gonna do them the way that I know it will work. And then on the other side you have the risk and that can be the, the artist side, the creative side to say, yeah, I know that'll work, but maybe there's a better way, right? And so balancing these as you go forward is gonna be a big part of developing in your career. So you're always wanting to look for, maybe I can learn a new way, maybe I can invent a new way, uh, but I know I have this tradition to build on. And so figuring out how to balance those things by applying what you know and developing new things will help you tremendously. Um, so a few ways of sort of developing this spirit of craftsmanship. One